Hey, we're glad that you're here this morning. And uh, uh, one of the things uh, as we walking through uh, this new series about cardio, about your heart, uh, as Roger and I were talking through that, for me, what would that look like? And so one, one of the things that I've had to wrestle with uh, for a long time um, is that um, is, is having a teachable, a teachable heart. Because uh, th- there are things in your life that you just, um, that you know lots of things about. I, I grew up going to church. I grew up in the church. I mean, I probably have missed maybe, maybe 50 Sundays my entire life. I, I've just grown up in the church. Um, uh, reading the Bible was something that has been instilled in me since a little kid, and uh, I, I, I was bribed to read it for money growing up in children's ministry. And so, and then you have programs like Awana uh, that you get prizes for memorizing verses. And so, man, I could, I, I could read the Bible, know the Bible, quote the Bible. Um, I grew up in St. Louis, and so in St. Louis, um, for me, uh, I, I am a... a I am a self-proclaimed expert in all things baseball, right? Uh, and so you could talk, we could talk about baseball in the 60s before I was born, 70s when I was barely old enough to remember baseball, 80s in the heyday when the Cardinals made three World Series and unfortunately lost to that one terrible team up north in 87. Um, but but I, all things, I, I could talk about baseball, I could talk about teams and specific players and specific events. I, I remember when a catcher for the St. Louis Cardinals uh, named Glenn Brummer stole home against the San Francisco Giants. I remember exactly where I was when it happened. But what happens is, is that what was that? Yeah, uh, no, I was with my I was with my grandfather. I was with my grandfather uh, working in the garden, listening to it on the radio. I remember exactly where I was. Um, but but the thing is, is sometimes we we, we get so familiar with things. Uh, that we proclaim ourselves to be experts, and then what we fail to do is, is realize that we're always growing, or always needing to grow, always needing to learn, and we need to continue to put ourselves in a situation, in a position where we are constantly <coughs> learning. And so in order to do that, we got to understand that some of our tendency sometime is to come across that we know it already, and that it applies to the people sitting around the table and not to us. Um, so I, I wanted to give you just a snapshot of, of, of a little bit of my, uh, of my this, is, this is my current reading, all right? Uh, because I read differently. Um, I, I can't just sit down and read a book uh, because I would get, I have ADHD, and I, you know, I, 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 I take medicine for that. And so um, uh, I would get bored reading a single book the entire time, Right? Uh, and so what I do is, is I read multiple books at a time because it's kind of like cleansing your palate. You know, like you, you, you taste something and you got to take some water and cleanse it so you can try something else. So I'll read two to three books and take some notes and read through stuff and then pick up another book so that it can break up the monotony of one topic the entire time. So, uh, so right now, this is a book on evangelism. This is a book about uh, how I can encourage more of our people to understand the gospel and how to share that. Um, so actually this will be the basis of an Institute for Gospel Growth class in the fall. Uh, I'm, I work a lot with our, our staff, and so um, I'm, we're reading a book as a leadership team called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Uh, if you haven't read this book and you lead teams, you should read this book, and you should make your teams read this book. Uh, this is how to deal with conflict and how to build greater trust on your teams. Uh, the Best Team Wins, this is a book on how to uh, create a culture within your teams where you build into and encourage one another in such a way that you have the best interest for everybody else's team. Uh, fascinating book. Less Chaos, Less Noise, this is a book specifically on church communication. Uh, it's probably the one area that I'm trying to focus on the most with our church right now is how can we communicate better. Uh, well, I'm not a communications expert. You don't want me writing a lot of things. Um, because I'm going to spell it wrong, or I'm, gonna, I'm not going to phrase it right, so I'm reading this with our communications team. Uh, this is a book, uh, this author is going to be here in a couple of weeks uh, at a, an event that we're holding called Christ Hold Fast, with Pastor West is teaching it as well. Uh, but this book right here is about the gospel-driven church and how to create moments. And this is probably the one-off book. I try to do two of these a year. This is a fiction book, because I just need to relax. And not always be on the go. I say all that because this, these are all things that I could probably say, hey, I know a little bit about each of those areas. But at the end of the day, I need to 
put myself in, in a, an environment and in a situation where there's, there are other people in the room, in Christianity, in the church, who are smarter than I am. And because they're smarter than I am, I need to make sure that I am putting myself in a place where I can be consistently learning of what's going on, not only in my world, in my church, but then also in a deeper way, how does it drive me to this? How does it drive me to this? Proverbs 13, 10 says this, by insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. So insolence is this, this whole uh, reckless behavior that, that you know it all, that you don't need anybody's help, that you want to be self-sufficient. Uh, I learned that really, really well from my dad. Uh, my dad was a very proud man. My dad broke his foot one time, and uh, uh, he didn't trust us to mow the grass, and I kind of get that because sometimes I don't trust my sons to mow the grass because I like them lines and you know patterns, and and then my son is like this everywhere, and and um, and so my dad broke his foot and, and didn't really trust us to do it, so he duct taped himself to the mower because he wouldn't ask for anybody else's help. Wanted to do it on his own, and that was destructive, right? It took him like four and a half hours to mow the grass when it shouldn't have. And it caused him much more pain because he wouldn't go to the doctor to get it cast. And so when, when, when the writer of, of Proverbs is talking about, by insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice as wisdom. In other words, that there is a point in a time in our lives where we, we say, you know what, I, I may not know it all. And so therefore, I'm going to seek understanding and knowledge and wisdom. Think about the, uh, the opposite of being teachable, right, is, is prideful. My dad, I remember I was going to Kansas City, Missouri for a, a, a competition. And this was back before, you know, you could just pull out your phone and plug it in and it would take you directly there. And so we actually had to use maps. We had a map in the glove box. I don't know if it ever had been opened. Because my dad just knew where to go all the time. And so we, were go we lived in the St. Louis area, so we were going north. It's at St. Joseph, Missouri, just north of Kansas City. And we were going there, and my dad decided that he didn't need the map, but he knew exactly where he was going. Well, as we were rolling through Kansas City, he got turned around, and we ended up in a very bad part of Kansas City. And he had no idea where we were. So finally, my mom is... My mom is struggling and crying and saying, maybe we should stop and ask for help. And we stopped and asked for help. And here's what the guy told us as we stopped and asked for help. I think I was a, I, I was a senior in high school. And this is, what the, this is what the guy said to us as we're sitting here in this very bad part. He goes, what I would do is I would, I would make a U-turn. I would go exactly the way you came until, until you see an interstate. And then when you get on it, say, I don't care if you go left or right, you go whatever way. He says, but you cannot stay here. This is not safe for you. Whipped a Yui, went the opposite direction, ended up getting But it was, came to that point, to that breaking point, where Dad finally thought maybe I should ask because it doesn't look safe, it doesn't seem safe. Mom was upset. She knew it wasn't safe. But he just didn't want to stop and ask. Why? Because his pride was, I know where I'm going, and I know how to get there, and I know the best way to do it. And the reality is, is for us, in our hearts, sometimes maybe the best thing for us is to stop and ask questions. It's one of the things that probably drives, um, well, there's probably several things that drive my wife nuts, but one of the things that drive my wife nuts is the fact that I ask lots of questions. I ask tons of questions. If she says, hey, what do you want to do for dinner tonight? I respond with, what are my options? <laughs> no, she, I asked you what you wanted for dinner. I said, I understand that, but what are my options? Because if you give me three options, I'll choose one of the best of three options. Sitting in and being new to the environment here at Berean, one of the things that I've done over the past year, 14 months, is just ask questions. Why do we do it that way? Well, that's just the way we've always done it. That's great. However... Is that the best way for us moving forward? Uh, why, why? So when we start asking questions, what happens is, is that it, it allows us to learn from those that are around us rather than just thinking, well, we know best because this is A, the way that we've always done it, or B, it's the way that I feel the most comfortable with. 
And that nece- doesn't necessarily provide for in our areas, in our families, in our businesses, in our churches, doesn't necessarily lend itself to be the best environment for growth. So what does Proverbs say? One of the things about Proverbs is um, Proverbs isn't necessarily a continuous thread story, right? Uh, Proverbs are these short, little, plithy uh, expressions or segments of things that are true because they're Scripture, but then also can be applied in various different environments. And so Proverbs has a lot to say about being teachable. Um, Here's what Proverbs 26, 12 says. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Let me read that again. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In other words, the guy who walks around doesn't know anything and and does all these crazy things, there's more hope for him than a guy who thinks in his own eyes that he's, he's wise or he's arrived, that he knows it. Proverbs 18.2 says this, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing, expressing his opinion. In other words, rather than being cautious and asking questions and, and seeking advice and seeking wisdom, a fool says in his heart, I don't need to ask questions, I just need to make statements. I just need to tell people where they're going wrong. I just need to tell people uh, what what I know about this subject because obviously I've been around the longest and because I've been around the longest, I know more about it. And the reality is uh, that's a fool talking. Uh, Proverbs 5, 12 through 13 says, And you say, How I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my heart to my instructors. Instructors. Uh, That particular passage in, in Proverbs chapter 5 is uh, talking about a, a father telling his son to stay away from wayward women. That a fool would say, okay, I understand, thank you for the advice, but I, I know how to handle this on my own. And then what happens is that you get too close to the edge, and when you get too close to the edge, all of a sudden you find yourself hanging over the edge, or you're falling down, and, and it's because, what he says here, and you say, I hated discipline. I hated being coached. I, I hate being taught. I hated being told what to do. And because of that, you got burned. I have a 15-year-old son, and it seems like I'm, I'm reminding myself of this passage a lot um, that he doesn't quite understand. And so yesterday, uh, yesterday we, uh, you know, snow and uh, I was uh, sick a lot yesterday, had, had a headache, and wasn't feeling very good. And uh, we were having this conversation. And so on your phones, there's a way to, to be able to determine how many minutes or how many hours you've been on your phone. And, uh, and so uh, knowing that my youngest son was out with a friend, Kelly was out of town, it was just he and I hanging out, and I wasn't feeling very good. So I just asked him, I said, uh, hey, it was about 4 o'clock. Hey, how long have you been on your phone today? Oh, I don't know. I said, well... Don't tell me you don't know. I mean, there's an app on there that we put on there. Uh, he turned it off. He turned that app off. He says, well, I've only been on the phone for 55 seconds today. <laughs> I mean, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night, right? And I'm like, well, you need to keep that app on so that I can check that phone whenever I want, and I can tell exactly how long you've been on it. What have you been, what have you been doing when you've been on it? He goes, well, why? I said, because... I want to know your activity on the phone. And he made the statement that all teenagers tend to make that I know that I made in my life. He goes, well, it's my phone. I said, well, there are two things you need to know about that statement. Number one, it's false. That is my phone. I pay for it, and I pay for the plan. Number two, you're my son. You don't own squat. And he looked at me, and I'm like, can I have my phone? He goes, I'll leave it on. I said, I thought you said so. I thought that's what you'd say, (laughs) right? But we have this mentality sometimes that we've been around long enough in the Christian walk. We've been around long enough in the church. We've been around long enough in our marriages. We've been around long enough as parents and as grandparents that we're still not needing to learn. I've been married for 18 years. Some of you have been married twice as long. 
for me to say, I've figured it out in 18 years, you would look at me and laugh and say, Proverbs calls you a fool. <laughs> and those of you that are married 36 years and say, hey, I've got this thing figured out, Proverbs would say, you're a fool. And for us to be able to say, hey, I want to be teachable, because the reality is, is for us to be able to, to admit uh, that we are still needing to learn, kind of puts us in a very vulnerable situation. Because in a way, it's, it's almost confessing that we don't know it all. In a way, it's, 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 it's kind of confessing that, hey, we still have room to grow. And yet for some reason in our society, especially in Western culture, is for, for a man to be able to say that, is, is, it's against all the John Wayne movies I ever watched. It's against all the superhero movies that I've ever watched, right? It's because they're supposed to be these big, bad protectors of families and faith and industries, and this is who they are, but yet the Bible is very, very clear. No. We're human. We have a starting point and an ending point. And we have a, a window of opportunity in our lives to influence those that are around us. So the, the question is not, you know, uh, do I need to learn? Do I need to be teachable? But it's how am I learning and how teachable am I? Because even, I'm, I'm 47 years old, and, and I think through what I've learned over the last 18 years being married and 15 years of having, being a father, uh, 20-something years of being in ministry. Uh, and and, and, and here's, here's, what I, here's what I've learned in all of that, is I don't know anything. I just don't. I can, I've learned from experiences, but the reality is for me to be say, I'm an expert in this, I'm not an expert in that. So there, there are a couple things uh, to, to just, being teachable means th these things. Number one, admitting that you don't know it all. Admitting that you don't know it all. Uh, even as I, as I read through things like this, uh, you know, I've read through this book a couple times with some different teams, and, and even reading through it this time around, uh, there's some different situations, circumstances here that, oh, this is, what, this is how relatable that story is specifically to our situation. I never think of it like that. Um, that I don't know it all, and that it's okay. One of the things that, that has the, one of the biggest areas of growth for me, um, as, a, as a pastor, you get asked all the time about situations and circumstances that, that apparently I'm supposed to know everything about, Right? Uh, and it happens a, a lot. You know, it's like, hey, I was reading this passage of Scripture, and, and the Bible uses this word. Can you tell me why, that's, why that word's in there? Like, okay, so do I answer from a pastoral standpoint, or do I answer from... So here's one of the, here's one of the things I've had to, to wrestle with, right? That it's okay to say this. I really don't know the context, or I really don't know the specific example that you're giving. If you will give me time to read it and to research it and pray through it, I would love to get back with you. It happened to me Sunday morning, three different occasions, when someone came, the three different individuals came to me and specifically asked me questions about the morning message that I had yet to hear. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to have to go back and listen to Pastor Wes, and I'm going to have, and listen, I said, and then I, I'd love to be able to get back, back with you. Well, this just doesn't make sense. I'm, well, you know what, there's a lot of things in the Bible that just doesn't make sense to me. And so to be able to admit that I don't know it all just shows that I have room to grow and that I'm still growing with everybody, that I haven't arrived. And what is amazing, one of the, one of the things for uh, my boys um, that they would always come to me, you know, if they got hurt or they wanted answers, and I remember the first time, Braden, Braden is way smarter than I ever thought I, would, I, I was in school. And I remember sitting down with him in seventh grade to help him with some homework. And as we were doing it, he goes, well, how do I do this? I'm looking at him like, huh. I have no idea. I said, you need to go ask your mom. Because Kelly was, was a math major in college. Um, 
I said, you need to go ask your mom. And he just looked at me. I'm like, well, I don't know. Ask me a Bible question. I'll give it to you, right? Don't ask me a math question. But I remember that is, then, then he started, hey, Dad, I have a math question. Do you think you can look at it with me? Then it changed the way he even asked me on how to help. Right? So number one is, is don't, admitting that you don't know it all. Number two, being able to receive instruction, correction, or confrontation humbly. Um, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. But then not, not only it's, is it okay to be wrong, or it's okay not to know the answers that, what is wrong is okay staying there. So when you receive instruction or correction or confrontation with about something, is to be able to receive it in such a way that it is a growth moment for you, that it's something that you can learn, something that you can walk through, something, I'll be honest, something that I can then use to teach those that are around me. So one of the things that uh, fascinating is about the, 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 the great commandment, the, the great commission in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them all things that I've commanded you, uh, we have a difficult time teaching other people what God's commanding us because we don't know what he's teaching us. So it's hard to teach people something that we're not learning, right? And so when we have those moments where we're, we're receiving instructions or corrections or we're being enlightened to a situation, it's not to make, man, how did I not ever see that? Uh, my reading plan, my Bible reading plan this year, uh, math, uh, in, um, in January, February, March, I spent uh, all three months reading through the book of Matthew. Um, even as I read through the book of Matthew in March, there were some things that I noticed and picked up on that I didn't necessarily notice again in February or March, even though I've read through the book of Matthew hundreds of times in my life. But as you read through that, there's some different things that God reveals to you in his scripture, or you see things differently, maybe even sometimes based on the circumstances in which you're walking in, in your, your current life. And so sometimes the things that we see and learn... Yeah, maybe they've been there in the background for a long time, but maybe, maybe it just took a, ver a special circumstance or a special environment for you to see it for the very first time and to be able to receive that in a way that you're then able to use that to teach others in and around your life. So being able to receive instruction, correction, or confrontation humbly. Uh, ask more questions than provide solutions. Ask more questions than providing solutions. Um, inevitably, we just want to say, when somebody asks us, hey, uh, what does this look like? Sometimes we just want to give answers because we want, to f we want them to think that they, we know what we're talking about or we don't want to burst their bubble of who we are because it's, we're trying to protect this image. Or, or, hey, if we don't know the answer, then maybe they'll stop coming to us for questions. And so, but asking questions is a great way to get more insight on a circumstance, a situation. Uh, for me, it's, you know, with, with kids, is it, my boys, is like trying to, get, trying to understand their mind. Like, what made you think that that was going to be a great idea? <laughs> I, so my, my youngest son, 12-year-old, uh, he, um, he loves snowboarding and skateboarding. Does it a lot. Um, probably was at Buck Hill three to four times a week. Um, I wanted to go yesterday, but they weren't open, Right. They should have. They would have made some money yesterday, but they, they didn't do it. Uh, he decided one day I was gone. He decided that uh, he was going to uh, build a snowboard ramp down our driveway. The only problem with that is I get kind of picky about the driveway, kind of like I do my lawn. When, when I do my driveway, I want the driveway to be clear, but I can't stand driving on packed snow and ice. It just, I, just, I just don't like it. Well, he decided to build a, snow build a snowboard ramp down one side of the driveway. Well, when you do that, it packs it down where the snowblower wouldn't even get it up. And I wasn't going to go back out there and take the shovel and take the pick and redo all that because I didn't build the snowboard ramp. So I said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to do that in the backyard. In the backyard, we have a little bit of a slope. So he decided he'd go do it in the backyard. Well, then he built a snowboard run through my backyard. But at the very bottom of that, on the, that side of the house, there's a fence. And so he thought, well, I just can't stop at the fence or go through the fence. He decided to build a ramp over the fence. Come stop, go all the way through, and jump over the fence. I said, you know what? I love your creativity. It's a great idea. But I don't want you to do that. Jumping over the fence is not a good idea. 
I should have, get, I should have been a little bit more specific. Because the, snow, the snowboard ramp went down, and rather than jumping over the fence, because you know, they, they, they have these things called rails, right? So you take your snowboard or your skateboard, and you, you glide across a hard surface, so he heard me say, don't go over the fence, but he didn't say, you shouldn't ride on the fence. So then, then he had a friend over, and they were grinding on my fence. So I get home, because I'm seeing the videos. My wife is sending me videos of what they're doing and having all this fun, and I'm like, oh, that's great. <laughs> so we, I get home, and we're sitting around, we're, we're eating, and I'm talking, so I said, let me ask you a question. So rather than, rather than just going in guns a blazing and saying, I told you not to do X, Y, and Z, he would have then said, well, yeah, I didn't go over the fence anymore. Yes, you didn't go over the fence. You were just on the fence. So rather than going in there, I was able to disarm the potential of escalation by just asking questions about his mentality of why he thought it would be okay for, rather than going over the fence just to ride on the fence. And as I began to ask those questions, it began to reveal a little bit more about him and his adventure attitude and his, his, his creativity. And his thought process was this. Well, you told me not to go over it. But I just thought we would have fun by grinding on it. And it was fun. And you didn't say, don't do that. So I thought it would be okay. So then rather than going in there with providing solutions of how he could behave better, just to help him think through for himself to ask himself questions. Hey, dad said don't go over it, but what if I just write on it? And just help him understand to learn more about his situations and circumstances and environment by what? Asking questions rather than just thinking he knows the answer. Ask questions. Ask more questions than providing solutions. And lastly, this here, boast in the giver, not in the gift. What do I mean by that? One of the things that I, I'm a huge proponent of is this, is that we win as a team and we lose as a team. And yeah, there may be something that we do with, with our staff, with our church, with my family, with our, the teams that my, my son plays on, and that it would be easy to say, yeah, that was my idea. Yeah, that happened because it was my idea. And the reality is, is that when you're working in a team, the team works together, the team wins together, the team loses together. And so rather than be so excited or boastful about, yeah, you came up with the solution or you're the one that pointed people in the right direction, give, give credit where credit is due. Number one, God. God gave me insight on that or God, God allowed us to do that. Or for me, it's people in my life that I want to make sure that I give credit for and credit to so that when our team is doing things, I want to make sure that I am giving credit to the team and, their, and the leader of that team. Yeah, that was so successful because this, um, the, the, the commit conference, right? Uh, and having all these men and, 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 and the, um, the level of teaching and the breakouts, all of that was good. But let me just tell you right now, Roger and his team deserve the credit. Those of you in this room that participated with that and on the leadership of making commit happen, kudos to you. And Roger would be the first one to tell you he's not going to take credit for it. He would, he would disperse it out to the rest of his team. Why? It's because if it focuses on one person and that one person alone, all of a sudden pride and ego get in the, get in the way. It's the team. Now, you have, obviously have to have a leader. But part of my responsibility as a pastor here with Brian is not to be the go-to person. It's to equip and to encourage those that are around me to be who God's called them to be so that we can grow as a church. Because if it just goes through Pastor West or through, just through myself, it becomes a bottleneck. And our teams don't thrive, 
our ministries aren't successful, and all of a sudden we just have an organization that is content with being an organization. So making sure that I boast in the giver and not just in the gift and the solution and what we came up with. And if that means spotlighting someone else because it was their idea, then it was their idea. But then the other side of that equation for me in leadership is this, is making sure that if something doesn't go right, is that I'm not blaming anybody else, but I'm taking the responsibility so that I then can begin to ask all the questions that need to be asked to make sure that we don't do that again. Being teachable is extremely important for our hearts. I just, you're getting ready to break out in your, your session, your table's here to ask some questions, and we have some questions for you to, to talk about. Let me ask you a question. If you knew what you know now about God 10 years ago, how would your life be different? It, it, if, you, if, you, if you say, well, in those past 10 years, that's what, this is what I learned and this is what I would, but now think 10 years forward. Well, the only way that that carries you to the next 10 years in that way is if you're making yourself teachable and understanding that in God's word, man, there is so much more to God than what we know. There is so much more to God than, than, than what we experienced yesterday. There is so much more of his in, inexhaustible. There, there's, there's a passage of scripture. I, I want to say this in closing because I think there's, there's something here um, as I've been walking through Proverbs of all things. Proverbs is, is the book that I'm reading through in April, May, and June with a group of guys. Um, but there's, a, there's a, there, one of these coffee mug passages, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make, your straight, uh, make straight your paths. Uh, you know, the, the implication there is, is that there's some things you don't understand. Right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, that your understanding is what? Limited. That there is some things that you don't know. And that you're going to trust God that, A, you don't know them, but you're going to trust that he does and that he's going to lead you despite what you don't know. Being teachable. Putting yourself in a position, in a situation where you are learning, constantly learning. Why? Not so that you can gain knowledge and so that you can gain notoriety or so that you can gain some sort of job or leadership. No. It's because the more you know him, the more of him you have to teach and to share and to give away. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men. I thank you for who they are in you. I thank you that, um, that you call us um, in, our, in our families, in our churches, in our industries, in our businesses. Father, not just to be men who know all the answers but putting us in a situation that we're learning that we're being teachable Father I pray that even as we sit around these tables and talk about some of these uh, these topics and, and, and interacting with one another help us to to know where um, where our fear is where our pride is that's keeping us from being teachable that's keeping us from being someone who is constantly learning. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you put people around our tables, put people around our lives that, that can sharpen us, that can encourage us to be all that you've called us to be. And realizing where we were 10 years ago is, is not where we are now. But then also looking forward where we're going to be in 10 years is not where we are now. And give us a desire to want to learn more about you and how you're going to use us to lead in our families, in our churches, in our companies, in our communities, in a way that points and honors you. Thank you for our time here this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Around your table, we have uh, so, uh, questions, uh, three questions, and, and it's all related. Number one is if you could tell your 16-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? So, so in other words, it, it, what, what have you learned over the course of your life? But if there was one thing that you've learned that you could tell yourself at 16, what would it be? And how would that have changed your life? Number two, what topic of discussion do you shy away from because you aren't familiar with it? So that could be finances. The, the heartbeat of that question is maybe even scripture, Bible, um, your, your faith. Because a lot of times we will talk, we'll, we'll gab, 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 gab about those areas that we, but then there are areas that we won't talk a whole lot about because we don't know about. So if we know that those are areas that we don't want to talk about because we don't know a lot about it, maybe that's an area in which you need to pursue. And then last, leaders are learners, learners are readers. What are you currently reading that is challenging you? It doesn't have to be a stack of books. It could be this book. What are you currently reading that is challenging you? Discuss that amongst your table, and then uh, we'll break apart.